This is going to be a recording of the History of the Waldenses by the Reverend J. A. Wiley, and I believe the original copyright was around 1860. Preface This work, which is a reprint of the 16th book of the History of Protestantism, is exclusively occupied with the subject of the Waldenses. It describes succinctly the conflicts they waged and the martyrdoms they endured as de in defense of their faith and their liberty, and is published in the present form to meet the requirements of those who take a special interest in this remarkable people. Recent events in Europe have brought the Waldenses into prominence and thrown a new light upon the grandeur of their struggle and the important and enduring issues which have flowed from it. To them, in a very particular manner, are we to trace the constitutional liberties which Italy at this hour enjoys. In the eventful year of 1848, when a new constitution was being framed for Piedmont, the Waldenses made it plain to the government that there would not be a sta standing room for them within the lines of that constitution unless it embraced the great principle of freedom of conscience. For that principle they had contended during five hundred years, and nothing short of it could they accept as a basis of national settlement, waited that any other guarantee of their liberties would be illusory. Their demand was conceded. The principle of freedom of conscience, the root of all liberty, was embodied in the new constitution, and thus the whole inhabitants of Piedmont shared equally with the Waldenses in a boon which the struggles of the latter had been mainly instrumental in securing. Not only so, in the process of time the constitution of Piedmont was extended to the rest of Italy, and the whole Italian nation is at this hour sharing in the fruits which have sprung from the toil and the blood, the unswerving faith, and the heroic devotion of the Waldenses. Nor is their work fi finished even yet. They have understood the, en the end for which they have been preserved through so many ages of darkness and conflict, and have energetically thrown themselves into the evangelization of modern Italy, and doubtless these ancient confessors are destined to win in the land where they endured so many dark sor sorrows, not a few brilliant triumphs, and by the labors of the present to add to the obligations which Christendom owes them for the services of the past. J. A. Wiley Chapter 1. The Waldenses, Their Valleys It was the ninth century, and superstitious beliefs and idolatrous rites were overspreading the church, when Claudius, bishop of Turin, who was deeply imbued with the spirit of Augustine, set himself to arrest the growing corruption within, within all the fervor of a living faith, vigor of a courageous and powerful intellect. To the battle for the purity of doctrine, he joined that for the independence of the churches of Lombardy. Even in Claude's day, they remained free, although many churches were more remote than from Rome had already been subjugated by that all-conquering power. The Ambrosian liturgy was still used in the Cathedral of Milan, and the Augustinian doctrine continued to be preached from many of the pulpits of Lombardy and Piedmont. This independence of Rome, and this greater purity of faith and worship, these churches mainly owed to the three apostolic men whose names adorned their annals, Ambrose, Vigilantius, and Claude. When Claude went to his grave about the year 840, the battle, although not altogether dropped, was but languidly maintained. Attempts were renewed to induce the bishops of Milan to accept the Episcopal Paul, the badge of spiritual vassalage, from the Pope. But it was not until the middle of the 11th century, 1059, under Nicholas II, that these attempts were successful. Petrus Damianus, bishop of Ostia, and Anselm, bishop of Lucca, were dispatched by the pontiff to receive the submission of the Lombard churches, and the popular tumults amid which that submission was extorted sufficiently show that the spirit of Claude still lingered at the foot of the Alps. Nor did the clergy conceal the regret with which they surrendered their ancient liberties to a power before which the whole earth was then bowing down. For the papal legate, Damianus, informs us that the clergy of Milan maintained in his presence, quote, that the Ambrosian Church, according to the ancient institutions of the Fathers, was always free, without being subject to the laws of Rome, and that the Pope of Rome had no jurisdiction over their church as to the government or constitution of it. But if the plains were conquered, not so the mountains. A considerable body of protesters stood out against this deed of submission. Of these, some crossed the Alps, descended the Rhine, and raised the standard of opposition in the Diocese of Cologne, 
where they were branded as Manichaeans and rewarded with the stake. Others retired into the valleys of the Piedmontese Alps, and there maintained their scriptural faith and their ancient independence. What has just been related respecting the diocese of Milan and Turin settles the question of the apostolicity of the churches of the Waldensian valleys. It is not necessary to show that missionaries were sent from Rome in the first age to plant Christianity in these valleys, nor is it necessary to show that these churches have existed as distinct and separate communities from early days, enough that they formed a part, and unquestionably and unquestionably they did, of the great evangelical church of the north of Italy. This is the proof at once of their apostolicity and their independence. It attests their descent from apostolic men, if doctrine be the life of churches. When their co-religionists on the plains entered within the pale of the Roman jurisdiction, they retired within the mountains, and spurning alike the tyrannical yoke and the corrupt tenets of the church of the seven hills, they preserved in its purity and simplicity the faith their fathers had handed down to them. Rome manifestly was the schismatic. She it was that had abandoned what was once the common faith of Christendom, leaving by that step to all who remained on the old ground the indisputably valid title of the true church. Behind this rampart, rampart of mountains, which Providence, foreseeing the approach of evil days, would almost seem to have reared on purpose, did the remnant of, a, of the early apostolic church of Italy kindle their lamp, and here did that lamp continue to burn all through the long night which descended on Christendom. There is a singular concurrence of evidence in favor of their high antiquity. Their traditions invariably point to an unbroken descent from the earliest times as regards their religious belief. The, quote, Nobla Leitzon, L-E-Y-C-O-N, which dates from the year 1100, goes to prove that the Waldenses of Piedmont did not owe their rise to Peter Waldo of Lyon, who did not appear till the latter half of that century, 1160. The Nobla Leitzon was, though a poem, is in reality a confession of faith, and could have been composed only after some considerable study of the system of Christianity, in contradistinction to the errors of Rome. How could a church have arisen with such a document in her hands? Or how could these herdsmen and vine dressers, shut up in their mountains, have detected the errors against which they bore testimony, and found their way to the truths of which they made open profession in times of darkness like these? If we grant that their religious beliefs were the her heritage of former ages, handed down from an evangelical ancestry, all is plain. But if we maintain that they were the discovery of the men of those days, we assert what approaches almost to a miracle. Their greatest enemies, Claude Sisel of Turin, 1517, and Rainarius the Inquisitor, 1250, have admitted their antiquity and stigmatized them as, quote, the most dangerous of all heretics, because the most ancient. Varenko, uh, Rorinko, prior of St. Roque, Turin, sorry, I'm not going to pronounce all these names correctly, R-O-C-H, Turin, 1640, was employed to investigate the origin and antiquity of the Waldenses, and of course had access to all the Waldensian documents in the ducal archives, and being their bitter enemy, he may be presumed to have made his report not more favorable than he could help. Yet he states that they were not a, a new sect in the ninth and 10th centuries, and that Claude of Turin must have detached them from the church in the ninth century. Within the limits of her own land did God provide a dwelling for this venerable church. Let us bestow a glance upon the region. As one comes from the south across the level plain of Piedmont, while yet nearly a hundred miles off, one sees the Alps rise before one, stretching like a giant wall along the horizon. From the gates of the morning to those of the setting sun, the mountains run on in a line of towering magnificence. Pasturages and chestnut forests clothe their base. Eternal snows crown their summits. How varied are their forms! Some rise like castles of stupendous strength. Others shoot up tall and tapering like needles while others again run along in serrated lines, their summits torn and cleft by the storms of many thousand winters. At the hour of sunrise, what a glory kindles along the crest of that snowy rampart, 
At sunset, the spectacle is again renewed, and the line of pyres is seen to burn in the evening sky. Um, I've heard that this particular book tends to have a lot long sections on the geography of the area, so if you really want to read about the geography, you're going to have to read the book yourself because I'm actually going to uh, skip some of those things because I really want to get to the main parts of the book that have to do with the doctrine of the of the Waldenses and the question of whether or not they are truly ancient Christians that potentially can be tied to those of the Reformation that can then go on to you know, post-Reformation and on into today. So continuing on, but to this mountain a higher interest belongs than any mere symmetry can give it. It is indissolubly linked to, with martyr memories and borrows a halo from the achievements of the past. How often in days of old was the confessor hurled sheer down its awful steep and dashed on the rocks at its foot, and there commingled in one ghastly heap, growing ever the bigger and ghastlier as another, and yet another victim was added to it, lay the mangled bodies of pastor and peasant, of mother and child. It was the tragedies connected with this mountain mainly, this mountain mainly that called forth Milton's noble sonnet, and he's quoting Milton here. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold. In thy book record their groans, who were thy sheep, and in thy ancient fold, slain by the bloody, bloody Piedmontese that rolled, mother with infant, down the rocks. Their moans, the veils, redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. The Waldensian valleys are seven in number. They were more in ancient times, but the limits of the Vaud Vaudois territory have undergone repeated curtailment, and now only seven remain, lying between Pinarello on the east and Monte Monteviso on the west. That pyramidal hill, which forms so prominent an object from every part of the plain of Piedmont, towering as it does above the surrounding mountains, and like a horn of silver cutting the ebon of the firmament. More description here of the seven different valleys in the Piedmont area, and then... Each valley is a fortress, having its own gate of ingress and egress, with its caves and rocks and mighty chestnut trees forming places of retreat and shelter, so that the highest engineering skill could not have better adapted each several valley to this very purpose. It is not less remarkable that, taking all these valleys together, each is so related to each, the one opening into the other, that they may be said to form one fortress of amazing and matchless strength, wholly impregnable, in fact. All the fortresses of Europe, though combined, would not form a citadel so enormously strong and so dazzlingly magnificent as the mountain dwelling of the Vaudois. The Eternal, our God, says Laguerre, having destined this land to be the theater of his marbles and the bulwark of his ark, has by natural means most marvelously fortified it. The battle begun in one valley could be continued in another and carried round the entire territory till at last the invading foe, overpowered by the rocks rolled upon him from the mountains, or assailed by enemies which would start suddenly out of the mist, or issue from some unsuspected cave, found retreat impossible, and, cut off in detail, left his bones to whiten the mountains he had come to subdue. These valleys are lovely and fertile, as well as strong. They are watered by numerous torrents which descend from the snows of its summits. And more description there I'm going to skip. Heart of their mountains is situated the most interesting, perhaps, of all their valleys. It was in this retreat, walled around by hills whose heads touch heaven, that their barbs, or pastors, from all their several parishes, were wont to meet in annual synod. It was here that their college stood, and it was here that their missionaries were trained, and after ordination were sent forth to sow the good seed as opportunity offered in other lands. Let us visit this valley. We ascend to it by the long, narrow, and winding Angrogena. Bright meadows enliven its entrance. The mountains on either hand are clothed with the vine, the mulberry, and the chestnut. More description. There opens before us a noble circular valley, its grassy bottom watered by torrents, its sides dotted with dwellings and clothed with cornfields and pasturages, with a ring of white peaks encircling it above. This is the inner sanctuary of the Waldensian temple. The rest of Italy had turned aside to idols, 
the Waldensian territory alone had been reserved for the worship of the true God. And was it not meet that on this native soil a remnant of the Apostolic Church of Italy should be maintained, that Rome and all Christendom might have before their eyes a perpetual monument of what they themselves had once been, and a living witness to testify how far they had departed from their first faith? Chapter 2. The Waldenses, Their Theology and Missionary Labors One would like to have a near view of the barbs or pastors who presided over the school of early Protestant theology that existed in the valleys, and to know how it fared with evangelical Christianity in the ages that preceded the Reformation. But the time is remote, and the events are dim. We can but doubtfully glean from our variety of sources the facts necessary to form a picture of this venerable church and even then the picture is not complete. The theology of which this was one of the fountainheads was not the clear, well-defined, and comprehensive system which the 16th century gave us. It was only what the faithful men of the Lombard churches had been able to save from the wreck of primitive Christianity. True religion, being a revelation, was from the beginning complete and perfect. Nevertheless, in this, as in every other branch of knowledge, it is only by patient labor that man is able to extricate and arrange all its parts, and to come into the full possession of truth. The theology taught in former ages in the peak environed val valley, in which we have in imagination placed ourselves, was drawn from the Bible. The atoning death and justifying righteousness of Christ was its cardinal truth. This, the Nobla Leitzon, and other ancient documents abundantly testify. The no Nobla Leitzon, and that's Nobla, N-O-B-L-A, Leitzon, that's how I'm pronouncing it, L-E-Y-C-O-N, the C has a little mark underneath it, um, sets forth with tolerable clearness the doctrine of the Trinity, the fall of man, the incarnation of the Son, the perpetual authority of the Decalogue as given by God, the need of divine grace in order to do good works, the necessity of holiness, the institution of the ministry, the resurrection of the body, and the eternal bliss of heaven. This creed its professors exemplified in lives of evangelical virtue. The blamelessness of the Waldenses passed into a proverb so that one more than one more than ordinarily exempt from the vices of his time was sure to be suspected of being a vaud v o v a u d e s not sure what that is doubt there were regarding the tenets of the Waldenses the charges which their enemies have preferred against them would set that doubt at rest, and make it tolerably certain that they held substantially what the apostles before their day, and the reformers after it, taught. The indictment against the Waldenses included a formidable lift, list of, quote, heresies. They held that there had been no true pope since the days of Sylvester, that temporal offices and dignities were not meet for preachers of the gospel, that the pope's pardons were a cheat, that purgatory was a fable, that relics were simply rotten bones which had belonged to one to one knew not whom, that to go on pilgrimage served no end, save to empty one's purse, that flesh might be eaten any day if one's appetite served him, that holy water was not a whit more eff efficacious than rain water, and that prayer in a barn was just as effectual as if offered in a church. They were accused, moreover, of having scoffed at the doctrine of transubstantiation, and of having spoken blasphemously of Rome as the harlot of the Apocalypse. There is reason to believe from recent historical researches that the Waldenses possessed the New Testament in the vernacular, the lingua romana, or Romant tongue, was the common language of the south of Europe from the 8th to the 14th century. It was the language of the troubadours and of men of letters in the Dark Ages. Into this tongue, the Romant, R-O-M-A-U-N-T, was the first translation of the whole of the New Testament made so early as the 12th century. This fact, Dr. Gilly, has been at great pains to prove in his work, the Romant version of the Gospel according to John. The sum of what Dr. Gilly, by a patient investigation into facts and a great array of historic documents, maintains, is that all the books of the New Testament were translated from the Latin Vulgate into the Romant that this was the first literal version since the fall of the empire, that it was made in the 12th century, and was the first translation available for popular use. 
there were numerous earlier translations, but only of parts of the Word of God, and many of these were rather paraphrases or digests of Scripture rather than translations, and moreover, were so bulky and by consequence so costly as to be utterly beyond the reach of the common people. This Romant version was the first complete and literal translation of the New Testament of Holy Scripture. It was made, as Dr. Gilly, by a chain of proofs, shows, most probably under the superintendence and at the expense of Peter Waldo of Lyon, no later than 1180. And so is older than any complete version in German, French, Italian, Spanish, or English. This version was widely spread in the south of France and in the cities of Lombardy. It was in common use among the Waldenses of Piedmont, and it was no small part, doubtless, of the testimony borne to truth by these mountaineers to preserve and circulate it. Of the Romant New Testament, six copies have come down to our day. A copy is preserved at each of the four following places, Lyon, Grenoble, Zurich, Dublin, and two copies at Paris. These are small, plain, and portable volumes, contrasting with those splendid and ponderous folios of the Latin Vulgate, penned in characters of gold and silver, richly illuminated, their bindings decorated with gems, inviting admiration rather than study, and unfitted by their size and splendor for the use of the people. The Church of the Alps, in the simplicity of its constitution, may be held to have been a reflection of the Church of the first centuries. The entire territory included in the Waldensian limits was divided into parishes. In each parish was placed a pastor, who led his flock to the living waters of the word of God. He preached, he dispensed the sacraments, he visited the sick, and catechized the young. With him was associated in the government of his congregation a consistory of laymen. Synod met once a year. It was composed of all the pastors with an equal number of laymen, and its most frequent place of meeting was the secluded mountain-engirdled valley at the head of the Ar and Gr and Grojna. Sometimes as many as a hundred and fifty barbs, with the same number of lay people, would assemble. We can imagine them seated, it may be on the grassy slopes of the valley, a venerable company of humble, learned, earnest men, presided over by a simple moderator, for higher office or authority was unknown among them, and suspecting their deliberations respecting the the affairs of their churches and the condition of their flocks, only to offer their prayers and praises to the Eternal, while the majestic snow-clad peaks looked down upon them from the silent firmament. There needed verily no magnificent fane, no blazonry of mystic rites, to make their assembly august. The youth who here sat at the feet of the more venerable, and learned of their barbs, used as their textbook the Holy Scriptures. And not only did they study the sacred volume, they were required to commit to memory and be accountable and be able accurately to recite whole gospels and epistles. This was a necessary accomplishment on the part of public instructors in those ages when printing was unknown and copies of the word of God were rare. Part of their time was occupied in transcribing the holy scriptures or portions of them, which they were to distribute when they went forth as missionaries. By this, and by other agencies, the seed of the divine word was scattered throughout Europe more widely than, in, than is commonly supposed. To this a variety of causes contributed. There was then a general impression that the world was soon to end. Men thought that they saw the prognostications of its dissolution in the disorder into which all things had fallen. The pride, luxury, and profligacy of the clergy led not a few laymen to ask if better and more certain guides were not to be had. Many of the troubadours were religious men, whose lays were sermons. The hour of deep and universal slumber had passed. The serf was contending with his seigneur for personal free freedom, and the city was waging war with the baronial castle for civic and corporate independence. The New Testament, and, as we learn from incidental notices, portions of the old, coming at this juncture in a language understood alike in the court as in the camp, in the city as in the rural hamlet, was welcome to many, and its truths obtained a wider promulgation than perhaps had taken place since the publication of the Vulgate by Jerome. After passing a certain time in the school of the barbs, it was not uncommon for the Waldensian youth to proceed to the seminaries in the great cities of Lombardy, or to the Sorbonne at Paris. There they saw other customs, 
were initiated into other studies and had a wider horizon around them than in the seclusion of their native valleys. Many of them became expert dialecticians and often made converts of the rich merchants with whom they traded and the landlords in whose houses they lodged. The priests seldom cared to meet in argument the Waldensian missionary. To maintain the truth in their own mountains was not the only object of this people. They felt their relations to the rest of Christendom. They sought to drive back the darkness and reconquer the kingdom which Rome had overwhelmed. They were an evangelistic as well as an evangelical church. It was an old law among them that all who took orders in their church should, before being eligible to a home charge, serve three years in the mission field. The youth on whose head the assembled barbs laid their hands saw in prospect not a rich benefice, but a possible martyrdom. The ocean they did not cross. Their mission field was the realms that lay outspread at the foot of their own mountains. They went forth two and two, concealing their real character under the guise of a secular profession, most commonly that of merchants or peddlers. They carried silks, jewelry, and other articles, at that time not easily purchasable, save at distant marts, and they were welcomed as merchants where they would have been spurned as missionaries. The door of the cottage and the portal of the baron's castle stood equally open to them. But their address was mainly shown in selling. Without money and without price, rarer and more valuable merchandise than the gems and silks which had, which had procured them entrance. They took care to carry with them, concealed among their wares or about their persons, portions of the word of God, their own, transcription, their own transcription commonly, and to this they would draw the attention of the inmates. When they saw a desire to possess it, they would freely make a gift of it, where the means of purchase were absent. There was no kingdom of southern and central Europe to which these missionaries did not find their way, and where they did not leave traces of their visit in the disciples whom they made. On the west they penetrated into Spain, in southern France, they found congenial fellow laborers in the Albigenses, by whom the seeds of truth were plentifully scattered over Dauphin and Languedoc. On the east, descending the Rhine and into the Dan Danube, they leavened Germany, Bohemia, and Poland with their doctrines. Their track being marked by the, with the edifices for worship and the stakes of martyrdom that arose around their steps. Even the seven-hilled city they feared not to enter, scattering the seed on ungenial soil, if perchance some of it might take root and grow. Their naked feet and coarse woolen garments made them somewhat marked figures in the streets of a city that clothed itself in purple, purple and fine linen, and when their real errand was discovered, as sometimes chanced, the rulers of Christendom took care to further in their own way the springing of the seed by watering it with the blood of the men who had sowed it. Thus did the Bible in those ages, veiling its majesty and its mission, travel silently through Christendom, entering homes and hearts, and there making its abode. From her lofty seat, Rome looked down with contempt upon the book and its humble bearers. She aimed at bowing the necks of kings, thinking if they were obedient, meaner men would not dare revolt and so she took little heed of a power which, weak as it seemed, was destined at a future day to break in pieces the fabric of her dominion. By and by she began to be uneasy, and to have a boding of calamity. The penetrating eye of Innocent the Third detected the quarter whose whence danger was to arrive. He saw in the labors of these humble men the beginning of a movement which, if permitted to go on and gather strength, would one day sweep away all that it had taken and the, the toils and intrigues of centuries to achieve. He straightway commenced those terrible crusades, wasted the sowers, but watered the seed, and helped to bring on, at its appointed hour, the catastrophe which he sought to avert. Chapter 3. First Persecutions of the Waldenses The Waldenses stand apart and alone in the Christian world. Their place on the surface of Europe is unique, their position in history is not less unique, and the end appointed them to fulfill is one which has been assigned to them alone, no other people being permitted to share it with them. The Waldenses bear a twofold testimony, like the snow-clad peaks amid which their dwelling is placed, which look down upon the plains of Italy on the one side, and the provinces of France on the other, 
this people stand equally related to primitive ages and modern times, and give by no means equivocal testimony respecting both Rome and the Reformation. If they are old, then Rome is new. If they are pure, then Rome is corrupt. And if they have retained the faith of the apostles, it follows incontestably that Rome has departed from it. That the Waldensian faith and worship existed many centuries before Protestantism arose is undeniable. The proofs and monuments of this fact lie scattered all over all the histories and all the lands of medieval Europe. But the antiqu antiquity of the Waldenses is the antiquity of Protestantism. The Church of the Reformation was in the loins of the Waldensian Church ages before the birth of Luther. Her first cradle was placed amid those terrors and sublimities, those ice-clad peaks and great bulwarks of rock. In their dispersions over so many lands, over France, the Low Countries, Germany, Poland, Bohemia, Moravia, England, Cal Calabria, Naples, the Waldenses sowed the seeds of the great spiritual revival which, beginning in the days of Wycliffe and advancing in the times of Luther and Calvin, awaits its full consummation in the ages to come. In the place which the Church of the Alps has held and the office she has discharged, we see the reason of that peculiar and bitter hostility which Rome has ever borne this holy and venerable community. It was natural that Rome should wish to efface so conclusive a proof of her apostasy and silence a witness whose testimony so emphatically corroborates the position of Protestantism. The great bulwark of the Reformed Church is the Word of God, but next to this is the pre-existence of a community spread throughout Western Christendom, with doctrines and worship substantially one with those of the Reformation. The persecutions of this remarkable people form one of the most heroic pages of the Church's history. These persecutions, protracted through many centuries, were endured with a patience, a constancy, a bravery, honorable to the gospel as well as to those simple people whom the gospel converted into heroes and martyrs. Their resplendent virtues illumined the darkness of their age, and we turn with no little relief from a Christendom sunk in bar barbarism and superstition to this remnant of an ancient people, who here in their mountain-engirdled territory practice the simplicity, the piety, and the heroism of a better age. It is the main object of this work to deal with those persecutions in the Waldenses which connect themselves with the Reformation, and which were, in fact, part of that mighty effort made by Rome to extinguish Protestantism. But we must introduce ourselves to the great tragedy by a brief notice of the attacks which led up to it. That part of the Alpine chain which extends between Turin on the east and Grenoble on the west is known as the Cotian Alps. It, this is the dwelling place of the Waldenses, the land of ancient Protestantism. On the west, the mountain slopes toward the plains of France, and on the east, they run down to those of Piedmont. That line of glittering summits, conspicuous among which are the lofty, snow-clad peak of Monte Viso on the, on the west and the craggy escarpments of Ginevra on the east, forms the boundary between the Albigenses and the Waldenses, the two bodies of these early witnesses. On the western slope were the dwellings of the former people, and on the eastern those of the latter. Not entirely so, however, for the Waldenses, crossing the summits, had taken possession of the more elevated portion of the western declivities, and scarcely was there a valley in which their villages and sanctuaries were not to be found. But in the lower valleys, and more particularly in the vast and fertile plains of Dauphin and Provence, spread out at the foot of the Alps, the inhabitants were mainly of Cisalpine, or Gal uh, I can't tell if it's Gallic or Galli, extraction and are known in history as the Albigenses. How flourishing they were, how numerous and opulent their towns, how rich their cornfields and vineyards, and how polished the manners and cultured the genius of the people, we have already said. Innocent III exacted terrible expiation of them for their attachment to a purer Christianity than that of Rome. He launched his bull, he sent forth his inquisitors, and soon the fertility and beauty of the region were swept away, city and sanctuary sank in ruins, and the plains, so recently covered with smiling fields, were converted into a desert. The work of destruction had been done with tolerable completeness on the west of the Alps, and after a short pause it was commenced on the east, it being resolved to pursue these confessors of a pure faith across the mountains, and attack them in those grand valleys which open into Italy, 
where they lay entrenched, as it were, amid dense chestnut forests and mighty pinnacles of rock. We place ourselves at the foot of the eastern declivity, about 30 miles to the west of Turin. More and more geography. In this particular section of um, description of the geographical area, it says, Historians have enumerated some 30 persecutions enacted on this little spot. One of the earliest dates of the martyr history of this people is 1332 or thereabouts, for the time is not distinctly marked. marked. The reigning pope was John XXII. Desirous of resuming the work of Innocent III, he ordered the inquisitors to repair to the valleys of Lucerna and Perosa and execute the laws of the Vatican against the heretics that peopled them. What success attended the expedition is not known, and we instance it chiefly on this account, that the bull commanding it bears undesigned testimony to the then flourishing condition of the Waldensian church, inasmuch as it complains that synods, which the Pope calls chapters, were wont to assemble in the valley of Angrogna, attended by five hundred delegates. This was before Wycliffe had begun his career in England. After this date, scarcely was there a pope who did not bear unintentional testimony to their great numbers and wide diffusion. In 1352, we find Pope Clement VI charging the Bishop of Imbrun, with whom he associates a Franciscan friar and inquisitor, to, es to essay the purification of those parts adjoining his di diocese, which were known to be infected with heresy. The territorial lords and city syndics were invited to aid him. While providing for the heretics of the valleys, the Pope did not overlook those farther off. He urged the Dauphin, Charles of France, and Louis, King of Naples, to seek out and punish those of their subjects who had strayed from the faith. Clement referred doubtless to the Vaudois colonies, which are known to have existed in that age at Naples. The fact that the heresy of the Waldensian mountains extended to the plains at their feet is attested by the letter of the Pope to Joanna, wife of the King of Naples, who owned lands in the Marquisat of Saluzzo, near the valleys, urging her to purge her territory of the heretics that lived in it. The zeal of the Pope, however, was but indifferently seconded by that of the secular lords. The men they were enjoined to exterminate were the most industrious and peaceable of their subjects, and willing as they no doubt were to oblige the Pope, they were naturally averse to incur so great a loss as would be caused by the destruction of the flower of their populations. Besides, the princes of that age were often at war among themselves, and had not much leisure or, or inclination to make war on the Pope's behalf. Therefore the papal thunder sometimes rolled harmlessly over the valleys, and the mountain home of these confessors was wonderfully shielded till very nearly the era of the Reformation." We find Gregory XI, in 1373, writing to Charles V of France to complain that his officers thwarted his inquisitors at Dauph in Dauphin, that the papal judges were not permitted to institute proceedings against the suspected without the consent of the civil judge, and that the disrespect to the spiritual tribunal was sometimes carried so far as to release condemned heretics from prison. Notwithstanding this leniency, so culpable in the eyes of Rome, on the part of princes and magistrates. The inquisitors were able to make not a few victims. These acts of violence provoked reprisals at times on the part of the Waldenses. On one occasion, 1375, the popish city of Susa was attacked, the Dominican convert f convent forced, and the inquisitor put to death. Other Dominicans were called to expiate their rigor against the Vaudois with the penalty of their lives. An obnoxious inquisitor of Turin is said to have been slain on the highway near Bricorasio. There came evil days to the popes themselves. First, they were chased to Avignon. Next, the, the yet greater calamity of the schism befell them. But their own afflictions had not the effect of softening their hearts toward the confessors of the Alps, during the clouded era of their, quote, captivity, and the tempestuous days of the schism, they pursued with the same inflexible vigor, rigor, their policy of extermination. They were ever and anon fulminating their persecuting edicts, and their inquisitors were scouring the valleys in pursuit of victims. An inquisitor of the name of Borelli had 150 Vaudois men 
besides a great number of women, girls, and even young children, brought to Grenoble and burned alive. The closing days of the year 1400 witnessed a terrible tragedy, the memory of which has not been obliterated by the many greater which have followed it. The scene of this catastrophe was the Valley of Pragelas, P-R-A-G-E-L-A-S, one of the higher reaches of Perosa, which opens near Pinerolo and is watered by the Clusone. It was the Christmas of 1400, and the inhabitants, dread, inhabitants dreaded no attack, believing themselves sufficiently protected by the snows which then lay deep on their mountains. They were destined to experience the bitter fact that the rigors of the season had not quenched the fire of the persecutor's malice. Borelli, at the head of an armed troop, broke suddenly into Pragellus, meditating the entire extinction of its population. The miserable inhabitants fled in haste to the mountains, carrying on their shoulders their old men, their sick, and their infants, knowing what fate awaited them should they leave them behind. In their flight a great many were overtaken and slain. Nightfall brought them deliverance from the pursuit, but no deliverance from horrors not less dreadful. The main body of the fugitives wandered in the direction of Maitzel, in the storm-swept and now ice-clad valley of San Martino, where they had encamped on a summit which has ever since, in memory of the event, borne the name of Alberge, or Refuge. Without shelter, without food, the frozen snow around them, the winter sky overhead, their sufferings were inexpressibly great. When morning broke, what a heart-rending spectacle did day di disclose. Some of the miserable group lost their hands and feet from frostbite, while others were stretched out on the snow, stiffened corpses. Fifty young children, some say eighty, were found dead with cold, some lying on the bare ice, others locked in the frozen arms of their mothers, who had perished on that dreadful night along with their babes. In the va valley of Pragellus, to this day, Sire recites to son the tale of that Christmas tragedy. The century, the opening of which had been so fearfully marked, passed on amid continuous executions of the Waldenses. In the absence of such catastrophes as that of Christmas 1400, individual Vaudois were kidnapped by the Inquisitors, ever on the track for them, or waylaid whenever they ventured down into the plains of Piedb plain of Piedmont, and were carried to Turin and other towns and burned alive.